Hello, everyone. Welcome to our newsroom. This is Dean Edwards with Democracy Watch News in Salem, Oregon. We're here for an update today about our news service, as well as an update and some context about recall elections on city council members focusing on the recall election against Socialist Alternative member of the Seattle City Council, Sama Sawant, who has in the past been on this show for Democracy Cast. So as we move forward in the next year, we are very focused at Democracy Watch News in bringing a years long effort to fruition. That means that we're looking for some serious seed money so that we can establish our services we're looking for people who want to work with us on that. Uh, they should look up our phone number, our contact information on the website, get a hold of me, Dean Edwards, and I will be happy to give you the entire outline of how we plan on moving this forward, scaling it up, in what sequence, and how we're going to grow this over the next five years to be one of the most comprehensive news services that we've ever seen. Uh, we've seen people do these things on a national level, on a state level, but never on an international level. There are plenty of excellent organizations who do parts of it, but we're focused on a different kind of viewpoint. I think Mark, you, uh, Mark Taylor Canfield in Seattle is going to be following this up with that report on Seattle City Council. And Mark, uh, Mark used to work for Free Speech Radio News. He was a breaking news anchor. He did a lot of other work with them. He's used to working with the kind of grassroots journalism network where journalists are reporting from the grass, as they say in Arabic, or from the grassroots. So you get a different perspective. It's not a top-down view. It's a view from the field. It's a view from the people. And those are news stories that are engaging. They, they focus on narrative writing a lot, and narrative writing always draws audience. There's a lot of special features we're going to be focusing on. We will be identifying best practices and talking about them over the next several weeks. We will be outlining some of the things that we are doing. And I, I'm really excited about them because we've put years and years of work into this development. And that development phase is now at a close. It's time for us to start moving forward. The first thing we need to do as a global news service is to expand the model we've developed here in North America, specifically the United States, to, to include Canada and Mexico, as and also working with Noah Nash, who is now getting over some of his other obligations, including his personal health obligations that he had to see so he can do this work. Noah is ready to work with us and develop a, a network of staff members in Africa, not just in sub-Saharan Africa, but around the continent working with me on the North Africa part. And we're going to be doing some exciting reporting. The amount of news that's available from Africa is difficult to, to quantize. We don't really know, except whenever I look at any one location in Africa, there's a lot of news. And we have a network which spans the continent. And I'm, I'm in terms of our contacts, we know who the organizations are, who the agencies are, who the individual sources are. We know who's making the news. We know who's doing the good reporting. We're paying attention to how they're doing their reporting. And we are going to be following up on that, drawing those lessons and incorporating them. We've done a lot of pilot testing. We know what works and it's time to roll it out. So anybody interested, this is what we need. We need people to focus on our communications aspect, the telecommunications. And we've got Sally Gellert with us, who's on the call today. Sally has been working in this field for at least eight years now. And, and she's, she's very confident, in it, confident and competent in it. She knows what to do. We've got Sean Harvey, who has an advanced degree in internet technology and telecommunications. So we can handle this both on a practical level and on a serious academic level. So the 
people want to come in, they want to learn good 20th, 21st century skills in how media works today, telecommunications, assistant producer, we're going to have multiple of those positions for all nine regions around the world. We're going to start with Africa and North America, and then we're going to also develop additional people in those categories for what we call sub-regions. And we'll talk about that in January, what the sub-regions are. There'll be multiple sub-regions. So we'll, these teams will be based on the following. The telecommunications position, the internet broadcasting position focusing on audio. The audio internet broadcasting deals with podcasting. Podcasting brings us right into radio on demand through internet radio, places like uh, Stitcher and TuneIn Radio, which we've been on for years. And a little heads up for people doing that. If you haven't updated your RSS feeds to uh, so that the HTTP is now HTTPS when your provider has mandated that, you may find your, your RSS is starting to get interrupted now to some of those internet radio outlets. They've been tightening down on their, on their requirements and been making sure the code works. So you might want to check your uh, settings in Lipson or elsewhere and make sure your RSS speeds are up to date. We had to do that recently ourselves. We also have internet broadcasting, which is audio video. Terrence Winder is with us today. Terrence is, is going to be doing a lot more work with that. Um, some of this work is also uh, done with the assistance of our editor for Press Freedom, Mark Taylor Canfield. You'll be hearing more from Mark coming up. Mark has been working a lot on Instagram. Terrence has been doing some work on Instagram as well. And the Instagram is instagram.com slash democracy watch news. And that's all lowercase. It's all together. And it's, a, it's an easy channel to find. And it's got a lot of good content content in it. Mark has been doing regular updates. I urge people to take a good look at that because you will not be dis disappointed. I'm saying urge because the kind of news that Mark reports is not what you're used to hearing because Mark is out in the field. He's listening to people and he's digesting that and making it available to you. So you, if you want to see an integrated means of communicating the news to people. It takes best practices in technology, best practices in reporting, that digests it all so that at a glance, you can understand the basis of what's going on in the world with links to more detailed information. That's what we're about. There's another category we're gonna be working with. We're gonna be developing data and digital editors. We're also, and that's one position, we'll have nine of those around the world. We're going to have chief international, we're gonna have international correspondents, chief international correspondents will be staff members at an editor level position. We'll have nine of those around the world. Uh, plus, and, and three of those will also function as part of the international team. Uh, we will also have a network of correspondents that we will compete to represent by distributing their content. The number of those depends on how we scale this out and sequence it. The slots are all assigned all over the world in, in great detail as to where they need to be. And it's spread thin over the world, but it ends up being a very large organization. And we're going to need people to help us with the seed funding and later on with the funding to roll this out. I guarantee you, you will not be disappointed. Why should we do this? Because those needs are not being well met right now. People are not being held to proper journalism standards in terms of ethics, in terms of what words mean. The uh, ethics require good style and the style requires that you look everything up. Your punctuation, your words, everything is verified. Then you go to print, then you go to broadcast. That's what we're working on doing. The other thing we're doing, and I'll wrap this up with Twitter Spaces, because that is a real work in progress. They've done a lot of good work on it lately. Uh, it's been moving along. They started it about April, March or April. 
And I've been working with one lady who has been doing Twitter spaces since April. She's very good at it. I've been learning a lot from her. I can also rep rep uh, recommend Hopewell Chinano in Africa. Listen to Hopewell's spaces. He'll give you a clinic in how to handle high level people who want to, who want to, to express themselves. They're passionate about their positions, about the power they have or the responsibilities they have. And Hopewell brings on people that sometimes demand more time than he has scheduled and he has to work with that. So you wanna watch journalism developing in real time in the 20th century on cutting edge technology. I say, look for Hopewell Chinano. There's an apostrophe there. So you're gonna to have to look up, look up his spelling and you'll see it's Chinano. And, uh, and you'll, you'll see where the apostrophe is. I'll let you do that research. He's a great journalist, an award-winning journalist, and I, I urge you to, to watch him. We are working with the Sudanese and getting reports from around Sudan that I don't see being covered by anybody. So these reports mean nothing if we can't get them out. This is why the production people are so important. We also have coordinating editors for each of the regions on, in our organization chart. We're going to be needing to fill those out in order to organize those areas. We have news anchor or hosts for live events, such as I'm doing right now. And we have engagement editors. And I'll talk about engagement editors next week because that's what pulls the networks together. And we've learned a lot about building networks. And my reference to that is take a look at who follows us and who we follow. The people at the, most recently tend to be activists. So you may not have heard of them they're not organization specific but when you look at the organizations that are involved with us uh, the agencies and organizations uh, i think you will recognize many of them and when you start following up you'll see that we have attracted a lot of attention what democracy watch news does is when you look at our twitter feed it's organized and vetted in such a way that the information is reliable or it's information that should be in the record, at a glance, it helps you shape your worldview. So are we tailoring your worldview for you? Yes, but it's at your option. You don't have to look at each item. But if you look at the items, you'll get a picture of the struggles for democracy around the world. And if you, if, if you had a way of going back over the last eight years, you'll see that we've been building this and building this and building this so people have a genuine understanding of what issues are important for building and sustaining healthy democracies. That's our main task. And we're gonna be talking about some of the evaluation criteria in January as well. That's my report. That's where we're going with this. I am very excited about this because I put over 21,000 hours into it over the last eight years and I'm ready to go. My question is, are you ready to come along with us? If so, do you wanna learn 21st century job skills that you can take not only to journalism, but to other industries as well? We're here to show you how to do it and by working with us. Now let's go to something more topical, something that reflects the struggles for democracy. What happens when large corporate money is inserted itself into our process to challenge political office holders because they don't like what they're doing. Not because they're violating their oath of office, not because they're taking money, not because they're degrading the functionality of their office, but because they disagree with them politically. Is that a valid reason for challenge somebody in office? Mark has been working on a report I haven't seen the details. We've only talked generally. So I'm going to go now to Mark Taylor Canfield in Seattle, Washington. Mark, I'm very much looking forward to your report today. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. Shama Sawant has spearheaded many progressive legislative initiatives in Seattle during her tenure on the city council, including the $15 an hour minimum wage, the Amazon corporate tax to provide funds for affordable housing, uh, she helped uh, push the extension of the moratorium on rental evictions during the current economic downturn and pandemic and other initiatives as well. 
Now, she may not have instigated all of these efforts to bring relief to working folks and people living in poverty, but she has surely pushed for them and campaigned to make sure that the votes were there on the council to get them passed. She's also been very outspoken in her support for the Black Lives Matter movement, for striking building construction carpenters this year, and for reforms in the Seattle Police Department. Sawan is, uh, has an international reputation, actually, and is a member of the Socialist Alternative Party, which has been described uh, as a democratic socialist uh, organization. But she's worked with diverse coalitions, including civil rights activists, progressive Democrats, small businesses, and labor unions. Sawan often cites the support of her constituents as the main reason for her political success. She's always spoke directly to the crowds that were gathered at the city council chambers during the pre-COVID meetings. Her impressive, well-organized outreach campaigns to supporters are far and above the best and most effective uh, and efficient system among any of the other council members. And she knows how to communicate her ideas and is constantly updating her constituents on important city business, something that the other city council members don't seem to do. Uh, she's also been faithful to her pledge not to accept corporate money for her campaigns for office. She stood firmly against Jeff Bezos and Amazon and other big money interests that are gentrifying the city and have caused the rents to skyrocket here because of increasing real estate prices. She was also a vocal supporter of the campaign to save the Showbox Theater from greedy developers who want to demolish Seattle's most revered music venue so they can build yet another luxury condo high rise, um, which, would, which are you know, unaffordable to the vast majority of the city's residents. So with that being said, and with such a credible record of public service, one would expect that Shama Sawant would benefit from widespread support inside her district and throughout the metropolitan area of Seattle. However, she's constantly being vilified by more conservative business interests and real estate developers who see her as a direct threat to their bottom line. And so they've tried to discredit her as some kind of radical Marxist bent on destroying the police department, et cetera. Um, these same corporate cronies have accused her of being a self-serving dogmatist. And in one case, an opponent in her reelection campaign claimed that she knew nothing about business and the local economy, despite the fact that this former college teacher has a PhD in economics. So we've also heard the racial slurs thrown at her, claiming that since she was not born in the United States, she has no business shaping public policy here. These bitter attacks culminated in a recall effort, which managed to force her to run for re-election this year, creating a major distraction during a very difficult time for her constituents and the residents of Seattle, due to the effects of a major pandemic and economic crisis. But Sawant has once again outmaneuvered and frustrated her critics, declaring victory against a well-funded campaign organized by some of the wealthiest business interests in the Emerald City. Millions of dollars have poured into local elections to defeat progressive members of the city council in the last few years, but so far they've been largely unsuccessful. Sawant's progressive colleague on the city council, Teresa Mosqueda, uh, won her re-election as well and was backed by an endorsement from Senator Bernie Sanders, who has also supported Sawant. Uh, the lesson here is that Shama Sawant and her supporters refused to back down when confronted with substantial criticism and money from conservative business interests who oppose her precisely because she is a successful and effective city council member with a very strong vision for the future of Seattle. So she has surprised the local media and political pundits once again uh, this has happened many times before. I remember her first election to the city council when she was uh, uh, running against incumbent, longtime incumbent Richard Conlon, that uh, the day of the, the election, the media was counting her out, saying that she had lost. By the next day, within 24 hours, Conlon was giving a concession speech and Shama Swant took her seat on the city council. Um, that also happened during her last election where the media was counting her out until the last minute. It's also happened this time. Uh, where the polls seem to predict her loss. Um, but once again, you know, the political pundits and the media have been wrong. Seattle's progressive tradition lives on despite the best effort of her opponents. So if we've learned anything during her tenure as a member of the city council, it's this. Never count Shama Sawant out. She's a truly gifted politician and a dedicated fighter for progressive values. And if more politicians would emulate her tough stance in supporting the working class and people living in poverty, then it's my opinion that this would be a much better nation and a much more humane place for us to live. Now, the uh, election will not be officially certified until December 17th, and it's a very close election, but she has already declared victory 
And in most cases, people have accepted that, um, that she is going to be our next, uh, she's going to survive this recall campaign and continue to serve on the Seattle City Council. And then this is Mark Taylor Canfield reporting for Democracy Watch News in Seattle. Thank you, Mark. That was great, uh, concise, and really informs people, gives them a sense of perspective. I want to refer people to Webster's Collegiate Dictionary or the Webster's New, New, uh, New World Dictionary. And when you look at the word corruption, you'll see the first definition always deals with money and, and assets and transfer to, it's literally a bribe. It's, it's, it's an old fashioned form of graft. That's what they're talking about. But the second definition means when you, when you establish something and then you deliberately go out to, to make it function in ways it was never intended to that degrade its effectiveness and its workability and efficiency, that is another kind of corruption. I call that taking an apple and placing it out in the midday sun and watching it degrade. And that's the kind of corruption that is involved when public servants, when government officials, when private industry, when anybody with resources use their resources to degrade civil authority and our, institu our, our the institutions that we depend upon for self-governance. And when that happens, that is just as corrupt, maybe more corrupt, it's, that's a discussion we can have another time. But it's all in Webster's Collegiate Dictionary. Uh, that's important because the, the, the other version of that same dictionary, Webster's New World, is the extension of the Associated Press style. So if you're using a style book or style guide and you need, you need to look up something that isn't in there, you go to that dictionary. So it's, it's a regular part of journalism. It's a regular part of every... Uh, person going to college and university, I encourage people to take a look at it. It will open up your minds in ways that we don't have time to do and you don't have time to listen. This is Dean Edwards with Democracy Watch News, giving you some encouragement on some easy things you can do to expand your vision of the world. And that's what this news service is about. You can find us on TuneIn Radio. You can find us on Stitcher by looking for Democracy Cast. You can also go to democracycast.lipson.com. You can go to instagram.com slash democracywatchnews. We're getting up our YouTube channel, getting that functioning. We're expanding our, our resources. We're gonna be doing some other venues as well and watch this space for further updates. And speaking of watch this space, literally, Watch for Democracy Movements Report on Twitter at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. No, that's, that's, the, that's the writer's one. I'm sorry. On Tuesdays at 1.45 p.m. Eastern Time, which is 18.45 Greenwich Mean Time. We bring people in from around the world. We've done Western Sahara. We've done the, the people in the Sudan. We even had them working together on one week. It's, it's exciting material because always something special happens. Um, one week we had a dialogue between people, a person from Morocco, people with Western Sahara and people in Algeria. And the person coming to us from Morocco was an activist for democracy and he had to present his perspective of what he hears in the coffee shops in Rabat and, and what their view of reality is, talking to people who are dying in the field, struggling for democracy against the Moroccans in Western Sahara who are under occupation, talking with a, with a, a, a gentleman, uh, Algeria, Algeria patriots, uh, Algeria or Algeri, Alge, Algerian patriots, who was speaking from a different position in support of the people of Western Sahara. And I call it a Ted Koppel moment. Go back and look what Ted Koppel was doing in the 1970s. We were able to bring people together to respectfully dialogue with them, with, the, with each other, put their armed conflicts aside, put their, their fierce passions and debates to the forefront so that they can do it in a rational, respectful manner. 
We accomplished that. More recently, we heard from Darfur. We heard from Khartoum, from the streets of Khartoum. We got the best description I've ever heard of, of what's going on in Darfur. And, uh, and updates from Khartoum, the way they get information from around the country. We're going to be making that sort of news available to you. One of what real people are experiencing in the diaspora and back in their home countries. We are one of the places to go. And you can find that by doing a search on Twitter spaces for Democracy Movements Report. We always have one scheduled. The other thing we're working on, I'm working on is my project is we're looking to show fiction writers and nonfiction writers how they can work together to tell their stories more effectively. What role fiction plays in illustrating points for nonfiction writers, news writers, what role journalism skills, intelligence gathering skills, business skills, science and technology skills, historical inquiries, really important. Anthropology, sociology, psychology, what those methods of inquiry can tell fiction writers so they produce better content. If you search for deep shadows, you'll find that's on every Tuesday at 8 o'clock p.m. Eastern Standard Time, primarily focused on the United States. You add eight hours to get the Greenwich time, so it's kind of late for them. But some people around the world, it's not that late. If you're in the Pacific, you can you can just subtract you you can subtract time to get to it, or you can work it off the Greenwich time. A lot of people in the world use Greenwich time. A little heads up for Americans: you will notice that Greenwich time internationally is often shared around the 24-hour clock. So you need to think of time in terms of hours one through 23. And, and then you'll be able to tell. So if you get confused, just subtract a 12 and it's, it's really clear for you. I hope that's useful. That's my little technical comment for today. Watch for Democracy Watch News. We've got some exciting things coming up for next year, including a special report on what we can expect in web and internet development. We've got a great panel we're putting together. This is Dean Edwards in Salem, Oregon. And Mark Taylor Canfield over in Seattle, Washington. We're signing off for today and looking forward to hearing back from you next year. We're going to take a little time off to bolster some of our services and spend some time with our families. Thank you very much. And bye until 2022. <laughs>